Across Europe, an estimated 240,000 tons of food are wasted every single day throughout homes, shops, businesses, food production and agriculture. That's enough to feed the 820 million people who go hungry twice over. And yet we can all do something about it, from taking simple steps to reducing food waste in the home, to making changes in the way we shop and putting pressure on our governments. This course will explore some of the challenges in tackling food waste, with a proactive focus on what you can do. Find out about the commercial food production process, the environmental, social and economic impacts of food waste, how a new circular economy model can help, and meet the businesses who are making step changes in the food industry. We'll equip you with knowledge, understanding and practical ideas so you can become an agent of change. By making small and big changes across your home and community, you can help transform waste into value. Welcome all of you to this focus talk on food waste. I'm John Paul Judson and delighted to be your moderator today. As you saw in the trailer, the topic of food waste is tackled in one of the online courses put together by EIT Food. And this is very much the spirit of this session. This is a learning session, a sharing session, and a session where we hope you will get more information on how to tackle food waste, whether that is on an individual level, on an organizational level, or even on a societal level. And to test our knowledge, we've put together a little quiz question to see if you know something already about how much food waste is actually generated, specifically here in the EU, uh, on average, by inhabitant, the latest data comes from 2021. And I see that quite a few of you seem to be experts already on this topic. It is indeed 131 kilos of food waste uh, per inhabitant, wasted, generated in the EU in 2021. So that's actually quite a sizable amount. And hopefully at the end of this session, you'll have an idea about how we could maybe start reducing that. And in this session, you'll get the opportunity to hear firsthand from stakeholders who are active in the field of food waste, who are shaping policy, trying to find solutions to reduce or prevent food waste. And they were, are really keen uh, to share their insights with you, but also to be challenged by your questions. Before I introduce you to the speakers, um, I would like to actually introduce you to yourselves. We had a, a whopping number of registrations for this session, close to 300, which I think already shows that there's a strong level of awareness on the importance of the issue of food waste. And it looks like you're coming from more than 60 countries around the world, which means that you're also bringing lots of different perspectives. And I'm sure that the issue of food waste will be perceived very differently across the globe. And we want to hear about that. We want to understand you know, how you perceive the issue. What are your value judgments when it comes to food waste? And how are you approaching uh, the best way to, to tackle, to reduce, and to prevent food waste in, in your parts of the world? So please get stuck in. Uh, there's the chat where you can raise your comments. You also have a Q&A tab where you can raise questions. And I'll be monitoring all of this and bringing up these questions with our speakers. So without further ado, let's hear from our three speakers today. I have asked them to make a very short and sharp presentation on their organization and on the main challenges they face when it comes to food waste. And I would like to start by giving the floor to Marine Tison. She is public affairs manager at HOTREC, the European Association for Hotels, Cafes and Restaurants. So please, Marine, take us away. Who is Hotrek and what are your main challenges with food waste? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jean-Paul. So uh, as Jean-Paul mentioned, uh, my name is Marine and I work for the European Association representing hotel, restaurants, bars and cafes. We represent almost 2 million businesses across the EU. And uh, it's important to note that 89% uh, of the businesses we represent are micro enterprises. So we don't represent big chains uh, of restaurants. And that's very important to bear in mind for the topic that interests us today. Um, so Jean-Paul, you're not showing the visuals right now that I shared, are you? So I believe uh, you know this uh, graph potentially if you, if you followed the course and <laughs> um, so it's just to show you know how much um, where the food waste occur 
uh, occurs in the EU. Um, as Jean-Paul Jean mentioned, um, in 2021, is, it was 131 kilos per inhabitant overall. And if you look at restaurants and food service, it's 12 kilos. So I represent restaurants. Food service is also something else, which is collective catering, which I won't touch upon today. But this graph, I think, shows very well that um, that's an issue that we can't solve on our own. And I think I imagine all other panelists will have kind of the same approach. It, we really need to have a holistic approach and work hand, hand in hand uh, to tackle this issue. Um, and that's one of the first challenge, actually, that I wanted to bring uh, to the table. Um, talking about restaurants, the second challenge which we can discuss today is what we refer to as conflicting demands. So you come to us to restaurants because you would like to enjoy a special moment. You're not coming just to get fed. So we are a service industry. We, 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 you come to us, you want to be satisfied by the atmosphere, by the service, by the food, obviously, by the recipe, by the creativity. Okay, so all these, you want these, but also as a consumer, you want fair prices, fair prices or sometimes cheap prices. You want a very large diversity of choices on the menu, but uh, you also, as a, as a very, you know, um, um, uh, important consumer who knows his environment, wants to make sure we have sustainable practices in the restaurant. So you would question if the menu is too long, that means how much food waste is generated. So we have to deal always with this kind of ambiguity um, almost schizophrenic um, uh, situation where we have to answer to many different um, conflicting demands. So that's one challenge I wanted to bring. The second one, the third one, sorry, is conflicting policies. We are talking about food waste. We will talk in a minute or later during this chat about the food waste reduction target that the EU is putting in place. Fair enough. We also are talking about something like reduction of packaging. Well, sometimes policies um, have different goals and it could um, it could conflict one 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 and the other. So we we are asked to reduce the packaging that we use in our establishments. For in some situations, the packaging help preserve the food. There is a meaning. There is a reason why it exists, and it could then um and yeah lead to more waste. So the last challenge, thank you uh, Jean Paul for bringing this, is more linked to how we operate as a small restaurant. So on this picture, you see. It's an organization co called Recyclo, who is working in Brussels. They are um, picking up organic waste from restaurants by bike, so very sustainable like green, in these huge blue blue boxes. Um, it's about 400 kilos they can carry on one bike of, of organic waste. They pick up the waste from restaurants and then they go and they compost it and they resell it to uh, farmers uh, all over the, the region. Do I have to stop uh, Jean-Paul already? No? Okay. And so this is just to show you how, again, sometimes we have good intentions and it's difficult to to put everything in place. The picture on the left that you see is one sh very small restaurant in Brussels who is using the service of Recyclo, so to make sure his organic wa waste will be uh, valorized. But because he has a very small space and a very small kitchen, he is using a big freezer to freeze the waste in the blue box that you see while he waits for the waste to be picked up. So, of course, his waste will be will be valorized, but then he will have to use energy, energy costs and everything to make sure his freezer works. But that's also linked to the challenge, linked to operations, which is the space, um, making sure we organize ourselves properly, we valorize our waste properly in a small establishment is difficult, and also um, in, in, a, in terms of staff. So one element that you have to keep in mind, and it was probably in the IT food uh, online course, uh, training is key. Training is key at every step of the way. And uh, what we face today as an industry, we're not the only industry facing this, is very difficult, uh, high difficulty to recruit. So this brings another layer of complexity. When you want to make sure your restaurants reduce waste, have a, a good practices in place, you need to, to train and train again every time you have a newcomer. So that's a, another challenge, let's say, to, to also bear in mind. I'll stop here and we can answer any question later. 
Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marie. And I mean, you really bring this issue of the of the trade offs, actually, at every step of the way, uh, you might have one objective, but then that impacts a bunch of other objectives that you might also have as a consumer, as an organization, as a as, as a society as well. And uh, yeah, finding the right balance is not always easy, even if you say food waste is the most important thing to tackle. <laughs> you still will create some other externalities by tackling that. And you, I think you, you represent that very well. So thank you so much, uh, Marine. We'll, we'll get stuck into the conversation uh, in a few minutes. I would like then to invite Vincenzo Palumbo. He is Area Project Manager for Banco Alimentare in, uh, in Italy. Vincenzo, you bring a, a very different perspective to, to, to Marine. So I do. please, over to you. Thank you very much, John Paul. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, first of all, I would like to present myself. I'm Vincenzo Paloma and I work in Banco Alimentare since 2018. Uh, let's give you some background about Banco Alimentare. Banco Alimentare is the Italian food bank. So we are a non-profit organization uh, that was founded in 1989. What do we do? We recover food surpluses from the agri-food chain, the old chain, and then distribute it free of charge to a network of partner charities that assist the most vulnerable in Italy. As you can see by the slide, Banco Alimentare is composed of Fondazione Banco Alimentare and 21 regional organizations. That is why on one side, the regional organizations perform an operative uh, on the ground function, uh, managing the processing of recover, storage, uh, with the externality that it came uh, with the storage, um, and the distribution, of course, to the people in need. On the other side, Fondazione, uh, where I come from, uh, fulfills a role of guidance and coordination for the whole network. Uh, I think we have an interesting perspective about the theme of food waste, because at the heart of Banco Alimentare's intervention, there is a, a double objective. On one end, addressing the basic food needs of people that are in need in Italy, of course, because we, we work in Italy. And on the other, contrasting food waste also through raising awareness uh, of the public, but also institutional awareness on the issue. Uh, in this context, we, we like to, to present ourselves as a, a bridge. We play the role of a bridge between the agri-food chain and the people in need and the non-profit organizations we are helping because we think that uh, food surpluses can be valorized, not only preventing them to becoming food waste, food waste but also bringing back the social value that food has um, since many people around the world still needing food. So Banco Alimentare recovers food, uh, as you can see by the slide, by interacting with every kind of, of uh, stakeholder in the agri-food chain, uh, such as companies, such as hotels, uh, such as supermarkets, but also we recover food from events. So in case you're planning to, to get married in Italy or whatever, feel free to reach out so we can, we can recover the food surpluses from your party. Uh, what about the challenge? For us, of course, the main challenge is, is always going to be uh, try to recover more and more food from the agri-food chain. Uh, of course, with a, with a particular attention to the companies that currently are not our donors. Uh, why this kind of objective? Um, we have to consider the context in which we operate. On one hand, we have the number of people benefiting from our services continue to grow, uh, then the need to collect a greater quantity of food is increasing. Um, I don't know if you know it, but uh, according to the latest statistic from Istat, Istat is the Italian Institute of Statistics, in 2022 in Italy there were 5.6 million pe people in absolute poverty. That's almost 10 percent of the of the country's population. We, as Banco Alimentare, as you can see, uh, already supports 1.7 million individuals, but uh, it, it is a, a a small part of the of the whole of the whole problem. Uh, on the other end, the increasing attention of the companies in the sector towards the food waste has led to a significant intervention of these companies in their supply chain to verify where the food surpluses are generated. This has made crucial for us to truly understand the mechanisms of the um, 
of the companies in the agri-food sector and to strengthen the relationship not only with large companies but also with uh, with small-sized enterprise or medium enterprise as Marin was saying. Uh, so in order to develop uh, a strategy uh, to, to enhance our recovery and distribution of food. In 2023, we launched a three-year research project in collaboration with the Università Politecnico di Milano. Uh, the project aims to conduct an investigation into food waste in Italy uh, to understand where Banco Alimentare can go to, um, to collect more food, mainly. Um, the first results are promising, I think, because 85% of uh, big companies in Italy are already active in food donation for food substances, but there is only 60% of the medium-sized company and only 52% of the small companies are um, engaged in this kind of activity. So these results indicate that it is a priority for us to concentrate our effort in meeting, in intercepting more and more these kind of companies. So the small enterprises and the medium enterprises, because there is a sector where there is not yet a structure management of the food surpluses. So there is a significant number of kilos of tons of food that we can recover and then of course redistribute to people. So uh, we are doing this, this in order to get more and more data and to uh, establish a path to, to try to recover more and more food. That's our challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincenzo. I mean, you're also then bringing a, a totally different angle to this food waste debate, which is the uh, yeah, inequality, fundamental inequalities in, in society, and then, uh, you know, trying to distribute food to repair some of that inequality. Uh, so it's not just an environmental challenge. There, there, are, there are other tensions there in society that we have to... That we have if to if I can, Jean-Paul, of, of course, for us, environmental impact is important too. But with the in the in the SG paradigm, the the S it's it's really important for us. Yep, thank you so much, uh, Vincenzo. So that was a second perspective, just to add on some of the trade-offs that we uh, that we've already started to approach. Um, and a third uh, perspective will be coming from David Lesens. He is the director of Food Win, which I'm sure he will explain much better than me as to what Food Win is all about and how you're dealing with food waste. So please, David, take it away. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, Foodwin is a, a Belgian civil society organization. We are an environmental NGO dedicated to the fight against uh, food waste. Um, we are the we are also a European uh, NGO that is part of the EU uh, platform uh, on uh, food waste and food losses, and. Um, we try to tackle uh, food waste by offering concrete and actionable solutions. Um, we train a lot. Um, we try to be a, to have a network function to link uh, people that have too much food with people who are in need of food. Um, but we always try to look at the food waste problem from uh, from the angle of the pyramids that you see on this slide. Uh, in fact, if you look at the food waste uh, problem. I, I, I think um, the majority of us know that the way how we deal with food waste, waste has different impacts. Uh, the, 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 the worst way to deal with food waste is to burn it or to throw it away in the bin. Uh, the second uh, worst way is um, to uh, use it as compost, as an, uh, as a, as an animal feed. Uh, it's, uh, it's better than throwing it away. But from an from an environmental point of view, from a social point of view, from a sustainability point of view, um, we believe the best way to deal with food waste is uh, by preventing it, eh? by making sure that food waste is not generated. Um, and then in the second way, um, by giving, if we cannot avoid food, uh, we give try to give it to Vincenzo eh? and to distribute it to social causes. Um, so as an as an NGO, we are an environmental organization focusing on the prevention topic, uh, and secondly, trying to have in the second phase a network function to help uh, link uh, demands with offer. Um, I'm mentioning this because this might seem logic to all of us, but uh, we struggle a lot <laughs> to make this hierarchy known in the debate, also in the policy debates on uh, food waste in Europe. 
And we see that a lot of initiatives uh, that are taken on policy still consider uh, composting, uh, using food waste as an animal feed at the same level as prevention or redistribution for social uh, um, usage. Um, so, uh, so that's why, why this was my first slide. Um, secondly, concretely, what do we do um, as Foodwin? Um, uh, we help we help all actors in the food waste value chain to reduce their waste. And if we look at the Belgian situation, you can see on this slide how food waste is generated. In Belgium, um, we have uh, plus minus 88 kilo um, per person per year. 37% of this waste is generated in a production phase on an agricultural uh, level. We cannot work much around this because the European Union definition of food waste considers this as not being waste. Um, so we focus on the on the on the other parts of the value chain. Eh? Um, and Belgium has a big economy in food processing. 25, and this is reflected in the figures. 25% of um, the food waste is generated in a food processing environments. So that makes us have quite an activity in supporting a food processing industry uh, with measuring uh, food waste, um, developing uh, food waste reduction strategies, um, offering trainings and so on. Then we have 8% in the service industry, um, retail and service environments, 2% um, supermarkets, the rest is on hotels, restaurants, um, uh, canteens of uh, hospitals, uh, uh, company canteens, school canteens, and so on. And this is where we currently have the biggest impact with our trainings um, because we have developed a quite successful business case around this. And we can also prove to uh, a hotel, to a school canteen, to a hospital, that if you work with us in a one-year training to reduce your food waste, that you are not only um, saving um, social and ecological uh, benefits, but that you are also winning a lot of money. Eh? Um, uh, after a training with uh, Foodwin, uh, a canteen reduces on average 38% of its food waste and wins a lot of money with this. Eh? Um, and then the last point, 23% is at the consumer at the household level, the food we throw away, you and me, in our house every day. Um, and for the last five years, we have tried to collaborate with stakeholders as much as possible in sensitizing uh, the larger audiences in Eur Europe about the importance uh, of reducing food in your fridge or in your home. But yeah, this is the bigger challenge I want to share with you, to be honest. And I think I, I also um, validate Marine's re remark uh, that says that um, yeah, changing behavior of consumer requires a massive effort uh, that no single actor alone can tackle. Uh, NGOs cannot do it alone. Companies cannot do it alone. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we are really desperately and but also um, enthusiastically um, looking for new ways of collaboration of multi-actor partnerships uh, because we believe that uh, this big uh, new partnerships are needed if we want to tackle the food waste problem at household level. Okay, thank you, uh, David. And as you bring in uh, indeed the uh, the comment from, from from Marine, I'd like to bring Marine and Vincenzo in as well. Um, you know, uh, we we just heard from David that you know training is obviously important, and he even mentioned in the case, for instance, of the Hureka businesses that it is actually a way of reducing costs in the end uh, if you have less uh, food waste. So, one question then is. Um, are all these systems sufficient incentives to actually make a difference? Or do we actually need some kind of much harder stick, like a regulation, uh, a, a stronger piece of legislation that will actually force these measures? Because as you were saying, Marine, there are all these trade-offs. David's saying, yeah, but operationally, we can make a difference. But is that a sufficient incentive for your businesses? Or do you think a policy, a regulation, maybe a target, a binding target, would also uh, help favor action in this area? So should I go first or Vicen Vicenzo? Yeah, that was, that was for you. Yeah, for you. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, thank you very much for David's presentation and Vic Vic Vincenzo's also. Um, 
And for your question, um, Jean-Paul, I mean, policy measures in principle, yes, of course, we want to be accompanied, we want, we want to be supported. More regulation, extra burdens, burdensome um, provisions to, to, to meet. No way, no way for small businesses, voluntary measures, uh, you know, programs, um, national agreements on food waste that exist, um, um, partnerships, public, private, of course, and we do all of these, huh? just don't get me wrong, because maybe I, I, I wasn't clear enough, but I should have started by saying we, we are businesses, huh? a small restaurant is a business. So the first thing um, that he, he, he wants to do is provide the best meal to his customer. And the second is to be profitable. Okay, so we, we they, they're very well aware, all of our operators, as David mentioned and Vincenzo, that food waste is, is wasted, is money wasted. So they, they have practices in place from when they order food to how they store it, how they cook it, how they choose their recipes, uh, how they portion the meals the pl in the plates to make sure it's not it's not too much potentially. Uh, the way they even deal with bread. Bread in Europe is is a very interesting uh, food item to watch because as a, in a in our culture in Italy, Vincenzo, I'm sure in France, in Belgium, you, you, we eat a lot of bread. Bread is one of the, the issue which is the most wasted in a restaurant. OK, so in some of our um, operators, they started to stop providing right away a basket of bread. Some customers will say, where is my bread? Thank you very much. Some will say, oh, OK, you change your practices. And then it's a question of communicating, uh, as you rightly mentioned, all of you, uh, to the customer that, well, we change our practices because we were wasting too much. So the minute you want something, just raise your, you know, call me, I will bring some more. There is another question about bread, the type of bread you, you, you use. You use uh, an organic soda bread, between you and I, often more tasty than another one. Well, it lasts longer. Right, so you could probably waste less, but it's more expensive too, uh, and so it's it's all a question of calibrating where and which string you can pull or not. Um, so, uh, so in just coming back to your question, and then I'll stop. I mean, yes, in principle, to supporting uh, uh, measures, uh, policy measures, voluntary, uh, well thought, well calibrated, and I'm sorry if. What you had in mind, as an example, Jean Paul, is the binding target, which doesn't does not even take into consideration primary production, as David mentioned. Uh, well, we, we we just said that we need everybody in the food chain to you know to work together. So just don't target us, which, uh, as uh, David mentioned in Belgium, we represent six percent, six percent of the food wasted. Maybe maybe yeah, so, consider so targeting target, other people. If there is a target, it has to be on a on a on a sort of system level, and no single operators should have as such a binding target. Do you do you agree with that, David? Is that uh, or do you feel that the kind of activities that you do in terms of training would actually benefit from a much more you know a much harder regulatory push that would then force people to find solutions and potentially go to you for for help? I agree with Marine that we need to find a narrative that convinces uh, uh, Horeca companies about uh, the, the 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 business case that can be made around food waste. And I, I from our practice, we, I feel that this is the most convincing way uh, to tackle the the issue with uh, with with companies in Europe. Eh? If you can really um, work on figures and show them the business case that can be made and the money that can be won. Um, um there are also other extras eh, in the in the service industry we find a lot of people also uh, working in um in sometimes uh, vulnerable home situations eh? many people doing the dishes in a in a restaurant or a hotel are often also uh, um, dealing with food poverty and it can be a very nice uh, team dynamics if some solutions can be found around how to go about uh, using the food uh, leftovers as 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 a, as a team thing, but the economic driver for us is always the biggest one uh, when we enter um, a, a company room. Um, we are we are 
Yeah, obviously, as an NGO, this being said, we believe that um, we need to find a, a way how we can put the food waste topic higher on the agenda. In Belgium, it is responsible for 9% of our CO2 emissions. And um, we hear a lot about farmers, about uh, nature uh, repair laws, about green deals, but we barely hear um, any uh, discussion about uh, a topic that re represents almost uh, one tenth of uh, of the climate uh, of the climate issue that we have ahead of us. So. Um, I think the advantage that we find about the EU directive is that it opens the discussions and it puts uh, the topic on the table. I don't know if a binding uh, law is the best thing in an ideal world it would not be, but at least it has the advantage that it, uh, it puts the topic on the agenda and that is something I find is desperately needed. Thank you. And, and Vincenzo, in, in your work of, uh, you know, yeah, raising awareness and, and, and communicating, communicating very much. And I'm just going to bring in a comment that I just saw here on schools. You know, what about getting schools involved? I'm just wondering, you know, A, would you agree with a kind of a very strong regulatory approach uh, in terms of a, a food waste reduction target? And B, how do you maybe work with schools specifically in getting uh, maybe food waste already from, from canteens? That could be interesting, but then also in terms of awareness raising. Okay. Uh, I don't know about uh, the European directive you were referring to. Maybe. A Banco Alimentare is part of the European Food Bank Federation, so the FIBA. We as FIBA had also proposed, as Marine was saying, to extending target to the food production sector because that is the, the main part of the food waste. So that for us, it is okay. But mm, let me explain what we did in Italy. We believe as Banco Alimentare that promoting policies and regulations is, is a crucial way to combating food waste. But you need to understand how you do it and how you're making policies. Um, in Italy, uh, this process uh, began in 1997. And then through various stages, we began. We, we arrived in 2016 with what we call Gada Law. Um, the Gada Law promotes the donation and distribution of food products for social solidarity and waste reduction purposes. How do they? How do they? The law do that. Uh, this law prioritizes, first of all, the recovery of food for human consumption, as David was saying, uh, but. Um, they also provide administrative facilitation and uh, um, tariff redu reductions for waste taxes to the to the companies that are donating food. So there is an economic drive to involve the companies in food donation, but there is no legally binding target to address. And we can see the results of this kind of approach because uh, we are now recovering for more and more and more stakeholders during along the agri-food chain also with schools not with schools itself but with canteens we work with canteens in companies in schools of course it has to be said that after covid uh, canteens are are not in Italy, in Italy, in Italy at least, um, canteens um, face the reduction in, uh, in, uh, in, in the amount of food surpluses we are recovering. But we are active through that also in the schools, uh, not only, but we try also to, to sensitize the, the students. But I have to say that a modern generation are already sensible of this kind of, on those kind of teams. So it is more easier to us also to access to schools to uh, talk and understand each other with uh, with the students and also with the parents yeah uh, a, a binding framework on at least donation i mean basically working on the pyramid that, uh, that, that, that that david presented would be quite interesting but to try and think about where it makes most sense to make something binding you know to ensure that at least food waste is not completely wasted right um, great. The, the other thing that I would just like you to reflect on, maybe very quickly, okay, like a short example uh, of 
anything that you've seen where innovation has played a role? Because what we're talking about here a lot is basically changing consumption patterns, changing behavior, raising awareness. But in actually kind of reducing or preventing food waste, does maybe technology or you know innovation, digitalization, does that play a role? Do you have like one very specific example that you could just highlight that could be interesting for the audience? Can I start with uh, well, Marine? Let's start with Marine. Yes, yes. Thanks for the question, Jean-Paul. Um, so a very good example, which uh, was um, a Portuguese chef in our membership told me, uh, in our membership. Um, so now he has a 30 uh, seats restaurant, 30 people. So it's quite a, a, a small, a small place. And to deal with the leftover in the storage that he has, now that he does now, he goes, he used ChatGPT. He, he, he puts the ingredients he has, uh, some of the spices and anything, uh, the, the, you know, some specifics in terms of date when, when, when he needs to use these products by, and that generates a few different recipes and that help him basically, uh, oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. That uh, that helps helps him generate, you know, um, being more creative sometimes. And so I think that that was a very good example of how very cheap, a digital tool can help and it could also be used um, at consumer level. Okay, yeah, interesting. So that's something that a chef does and that you can easily do at home. <laughs> okay, it's not one of those videos, you know, don't try this at home. It's quite the contrary. Okay, how about uh, David? Um, we, ha we had a, a press conference uh, two days ago in a hospital in uh, Rousselare, a small village in Flanders in Belgium, small hospital. And they have uh, come up with a great technologic innovation. They found out that the kitchen cooks a lot of meals in a hospital setting and many patients in the hospital get their meal in the no at noon and cannot eat because they need to be sober to have uh, uh, a diagnosis or uh, a medical test in the afternoon and they bought a software program that uh, scans the um, agendas of all the um, uh, medical treatments that needs you to be sober and they cross check it through technology with uh, the the lists of food that need to be uh, prepared and by just doing this one simple action with the computer they save 600 meals per week <laughs> Okay, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, hopefully that inspires people. Vincenzo, a quick example. Yeah. yeah, for us, I think it's important to distinguish between the use of innovation and technology in the food banks and in the companies and in the supply chain. Because for us, as a, as a food bank, innovation is crucial for uh, to effectively manage the food surpluses. We are already recovering um, rather than just the limiting food waste at the systemic level. But uh, of course, we are also on this kind of, of issue. And uh, in the last three years, we have adopted a web app that is called Bring the Food, um, born in Italy from a university of Università di Trento, University of Trento. Uh, Bring the Food facilitates the process by connecting donors and nonprofit organizations through a web app. So you can see what you're going to recover, not only know, OK, come here to get some pizza, but already know uh, what you're going to recover and facilitate those kind of contribution from a food way, uh, from a, a food bank perspective. From a corporate perspective, we believe that innovation can help, of course, uh, companies um, by making more efficient planning, uh, by giving them a control system and and then to eff eff efficiently manage food surpluses, also by uh, then donating food to, to Banco Alimentare, of course. Uh, but we think it is important in the, in the production process, mainly to have those kind of instruments. Okay, brilliant, thank you. So now we're gonna go for another part of this event where we're gonna bring in some uh, people who have taken the course, actually, the EIT Food course on food waste. And I'd like to introduce you to two learners uh, who are joining us and who will be able to raise questions with our speakers. So we have uh, Lee Le, she's an international business student. She's joining us from uh, 
Vietnam. And uh, Mai Magdi, she's a nutrition scientist, and she's joining us actually from the United Arab Emirates. So uh, I would say let's ask Lile first. Um, would you like to raise a question with one or several of our speakers today? Please, over to you. Thank you for all of your presentation. It's really nice to hear all of the thoughts and after taking the course is very good information to add up on. So I have a question for the Horeca industry. So I hope Marine or David can answer that. So Marine mentioned that 12 kilos of food waste uh, coming from restaurant. And I, I learned from the course that most of them uh, is coming from the preparation phase. And what leads me to an idea about luxury restaurants, for example, fine dining restaurants where we expect a very small portion of food and very high quality. So I assume a lot of a big part of the food is being wasted. But uh, on the contrary, it there those kind of restaurants have many advantages because they are they are fine dining. So uh, my question is, is it is it easier or more difficult for fine dining restaurants to control the food waste? And how can consumers, again, um, coming back to your presentation, how can consumers make a wise choice to reduce the food waste when they want to eat out? Please, Marine, yeah, go for it. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Lille. Uh, so just coming back to the numbers first, the figures, 12 kilos, it's for food services. So restaurants, it's one portion of these 12 kilos because in the food services, we have hospital and canteens and everything, which is a very different environment. So when how we tackle food waste in a hospital, as David mentioned, versus in a small restaurant or even a fine dining is different, but you know that very well. Just wanted to make, clarify the numbers. And then your question is, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, is it easier for a fine dining to actually um, achieve a reduction of food waste? Well, in a way, I would say easier than a small um, uh, restaurant with, who might be more struggling in terms of um, cash flow and then have less to invest in practices and also digital tools that helps actually uh, making sure to have a streamlined way of managing ordering, uh, storage, cooking, uh, putting in place, you know, um, um, innovative uh, recipes, uh, preservation, for instance, to extend the shelf life of products. I mean, in a way, yes. And then the assumption is that, and as you, you mentioned in your example, a fine dining would only use a quarter of the leak and then throw everything away. Well, I think it's not the case anymore. I think it's in, in, in people's um, idea and it's an assumption that people have, but I, uh, I really encourage you to go if you can afford a fine dining <laughs> and engage with the people and the staff there because the, the mentality, the mindset has really changed and uh, not just since uh, the, the war and the inflation, the rising prices, but even more though, uh, I mean, the, the inflation on food prices that we had in Europe, but also in your part of the world was so crazy that people had to realize that this was not okay to, to throw away half of the leak. And when people do it, even at home, when my husband does it here, I'm like, what the, wait a minute, what are you doing? I mean, and I think that that changed, huh? Uh, clearly. So, um, I'm not entirely sure I answered your question <laughs> in a very... Um... It's, um, it's this question of, of portion size, you know, and how much portion size influences food waste. So that's an interesting yeah. one. And it's true, you might get more waste in the preparation phase, even if people are eating less in the plate when it comes to fine dining. So that's an interesting, again, trade-off, you know. Um, yes, maybe... yes, but also... Yeah, sorry. No, no, maybe we can, um, we can bring in Mai as well. Maybe a question from mm. Mai, please. Hello. Yep. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, the nice presentation. Uh, my question is uh, actually to uh, all of you. Well, as food waste is a global conundrum and many stakeholders need to cook, 
to cooperate. How scientific research can aid in reducing food waste? In another word, what do food industries need from food scientists? Okay. Um... I don't know. Should I go to David I, first on that one? Or Vincenzo, you want to give it a try? No, no, no. I, I was just saying that I would really like to have those kind of answers, uh, but I'm, I don't. I can tell you what, uh, as I presented before, uh, we are trying to, um, not with food scientists, but we are involving scientists, as I mentioned, the research project with Politecnico di Milano from a, a business perspective to understand where food surpluses is generated and where the company can intervene in generate less and less food waste. Uh, about food scientists, I, I'm really, I'm really sorry, but I cannot say that. Maybe David can chip in on that one. Uh, do you work with scientists actually in your trainings that help people understand certain dynamics and what kind of research do you think is required? Um, how there were different angles to that question that pop come up in my mind. I think first of all, I I see that there is still a lack of data um, uh, on how much waste is generated. Uh, I think the figures, for example, that I show you about Belgium, how much food waste and which element of the value chain are the result of one research activity that took place in 2015 already, but there is not a structural uh, strong um, data mining or methodologic research being done around this in my understanding and at least in, in my context in Belgium. So that is, I think, a big question we have for the research um, world. Um, secondly, we like to engage with uh, scientists um, to see how um, upscaling of good practices can uh, take place and how also I think we are an, we are an, a very small action-based organization, and sometimes we find quite a lot of interesting solutions. But we need uh, the research world to link them to a bigger systemic uh, framework, if I can say so. And for example, we have been working now with uh, some hotels. We found some great solutions on how food waste can be tackled in buffets. I I'm sure the majority of the consumers or the, the, the people in the chat will recognize the feeling that uh, you're in a hotel enjoying the, the, the nice atmosphere a hotel offers you on a Sunday morning. You sleep long and 11 in the morning, you go to the buffet in the morning and you see so much abundance of food at half an hour before the closure dates, uh, closure hour of the of the of the buffet. We found great solutions, but for system change to happen, I think we need like to be able to link them to a, a kind of a bigger framework. I don't know if that makes sense on what I'm trying to say. Um, and then and then I think thirdly, we are really also looking at innovation. Eh? Um, I mean, um, there's so much space. Uh, it's like almost in, in, in uh, a, a free space, and we see that there is a lot of connection between food science and diets. We we have a lot of, especially in the bigger uh, kitchens and let's say in the canteens, we we are hopeful because we see that more and more uh, canteens starts to work with uh, dietist uh, with. Um, uh, food science, people that have been trained on food science from a dietary um, uh, point of view, and that is great because they, we can link food waste easily to that um, to that work. Yeah, it, it opens up many doors, and in the chat as well, there's a comment to say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, for instance, longer shelf life for for fruit and vegetables. So there's there's hundreds of avenues really that we could that we could take here. Marine, a quick a quick uh, jump in. No, yep. very quick. So no, no, very interesting question there. Are plenty of initiatives um, growing on this specific question between science, food, innovation and or uh, establishments. One uh, centre that comes to mind and we've been doing some uh, partnership with them is the Basque Culinary Centre. So they have this, uh, this genius place where they mix uh, scientists, inno you know, innovative startups, tools, chef, and they have a labo, a lab where they actually try uh, things on, uh, you know, test new products, new recipes, uh, 
another um, uh, example I wanted to mention is the International Food Waste Coalition. So it's also a member of the EU platform on food waste, uh, like David and like Autrec, like us. And they have this um, bank of uh, good practices and innovative practices that they regularly update with new startups that came on the market, uh, scientific innovation to also, uh, you know, target uh, the reduction of food waste. It could be from um, extending shelf life to a lot of dif different uh, examples. So there are a lot of different things going on in this field. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Lee, maybe another another question from you. Yes, I want to ask uh, Vince, Vincenzo a question on uh, the food bank because I really like the model of food bank, but then I realized that consumer or not consumers, but um, the citizens may have different attitudes toward food bank. So, for example, if I want to create that kind of organization in where I live in my community, what what kind of things should I take into consideration? Several, uh, <laughs> lots of things. Um, I think you have to, first of all, build a community. So uh, try to, uh, food banks uh, usually recover food to support people that are in need. So the first thing is to value if there is a need in your community um, about this, this kind of job as we work as food bank. Um, so I think the, the first phases you can do is try to understand if there is um, potential beneficiaries in your territory and of course potential donors. So try to understand what kind of stakeholders are active in the agri-food chain in your in your territory as a company, but not only companies, you can also, we uh, recover from supermarkets, of course, events too. So you can uh, recover food from pubs or bars or whatever. So try to understand where the food surplus is, is generated. Uh, I mention it as food surpluses because we, we are mm, uh, talking about the food that is not yet become waste, but you can recover it. So where the food surpluses are generated and where um, and how can you distribute to people. So you have to establish a network that is not is not easy to make. Uh, we in Italy have more than 60 warehouses. Uh, we have lots of volunteers. We we have uh, 1,800 1, volunteers all around Italy. So you, of course it, it depends about the the dimension of the of the work you're 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 doing. But I think the the first two steps are going to intercept the beneficiaries, the potential beneficiaries of the activities, and of course try to understand where the food is and if there if if there's food. I, I think there the food surplus is, is everywhere. So um, I'm not doubt I'm I'm not doubt that uh, that you will find it. But I think the the um, the main two steps are, are that. So try to to cover both 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 sides okay thank you uh, Vincenzo. feel free to, to, to ask more of course maybe my uh, uh, your second question then um yes uh, my question is to marine uh you mentioned earlier about the, the the organic bread which is more expensive than the the, the normal bread my question is what makes Healthy food more expensive than unhealthy food. Is it tax system? Maybe we we can change something about tax system. And how can we actually make a balance in terms of prices? Thank you. Okay, that's well, kind of that, that's a question, question for for manufacturers of food, not me. <laughs> I mean, um, what can I say? Again, maybe this is a generalization, and I appreciate uh, you, 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 you know a lot about the topic, huh, Mai, but the way you say it, I, I wouldn't say it's hundred percent correct. I mean, if you, if you, if you cook a meal uh, with, you know, a, 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 let's say a vegetarian meal with some fresh vegetables. Uh, that could be very tasty, and I'm not sure it will be more expensive than actually something that you 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 buy from a, a restaurant or or from retail that is less healthy. So um, 
maybe we can we could question that aspect of your question but uh, otherwise yeah it's a question for for the industry um but more and more what we see in terms of trends in our uh, businesses and it's driven by again we're just coming back to this by the consumer by the consumer demand is uh, local products uh you know less carbon emissions of where the product is from uh, yes organic we see a, a, a rising demand for vegetarian dishes believe me some chef like uh, old school they're like what the fuck is this but but they have to yeah they have to you know uh, uh, transform the practices and many of them are f ahead of the game already yeah ahead of the game sometimes it's um it's much more than vegetarian it's uh, gluten free or all the free that you can think about to uh, make sure uh, you can provide a, a meal to clients with uh, different types of uh, 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 allergies. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not sure what else I can say about the price. When I mentioned the bread, it's true that I mentioned not just organic, but also sordo. So it, it's also the way you do bread. And, 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 and maybe it's a question of, again, coming back to profitability. The more you have advice and measures which will be cost effective, uh, that will be a win-win for everybody. And then it will be much more easier to implement. If you if you convince a restaurateur that he can buy his bread uh, a bit higher, a sort of organic, but is uh, certified that it can use this bread uh, four days in a row, almost as fresh as the first day instead of one. Well, overall, the way you know, it's a win for him and for the customer in terms of everything else, health and and taste. So, um, yeah. At the, at the end of the day, it's also you know, are consumers w willing to pay a premium for something they consider healthy? Absolutely. You know? And if they are, then why why not put that price tag higher? You know, I suppose. Are you um, representing the industry, Jean Paul? No, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> I'm just trying to. I'm just an observer, a commentator. <laughs> Do you um, have insights? Thank, thank you so much uh, for for that exchange. Um, I, I would just like to, to to kind of wrap up. There was a comment in the in the chat uh, talking about you know supply chains and whether there is any research that would show that longer supply chains generate more waste compared to more local supply chains, uh, and whether that might not be an avenue actually that you that if you were to influence the production and consumption patterns of food, you would be able to influence much more food waste. And I'd just like you to reflect on that because I think it's quite an interesting comment and question. So, is there any research or any uh, any you know justification that would say yes, longer longer supply chains generate more waste, or is that a fallacy? And and do you think acting on that level would would actually be more influential in the end for food waste? Can I ask? David to have a go at that one. Yeah, it's a good question. I think according to me, um, it's a bit difficult uh, to, um, and I don't know if there is, I'm not aware of any research that shows that short chains are creating less waste than long chains, because let's say uh, a tomato grown in Italy that is harvested uh, and sold locally, but is there in the sun the whole day, uh, it will rotten more quickly than uh, a food company that uh, picks it up and puts it in a short uh, cool chain immediately. Uh, what I can say, and maybe also linking a bit to the, the previous question of May, is that we see what we see is a clear link between the quality of food and food wastes. I mean, uh, high quality, locally grown, um, uh, domestically grown tomatoes from my grandmother, I will uh, take much more care of them compared to uh, the cheap uh, tomatoes I, uh, I buy uh, in a commodity uh, store. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Vincenzo, do you, do you have any insights on that? Maybe based on where you get the most of your food? Not so much, I'd say, but of course we are taking the most of our food from companies, so for produ from production companies, but we are aware that food waste generates in each side of the, of the chain. So maybe, but maybe um, 
if you add more and more stages in the food supply chain, maybe you are also creating more food waste. But I don't know that. Uh, we we recover mostly from uh, from the companies, from the production companies. Right. Okay. Thank you. And Marine, uh, maybe one last comment on this question of the supply chains. Uh, I'm not sure about the supply chains. I mean, um, but just coming back to what Vincenzo, Vincenzo just said. Um, for us, for a small restaurant, again, food donation is very different from uh, retail or uh, an hospital or it's not the same time of dish. OK, so if at the end of one service one night you have a, a pre prepared food of in equivalent to five plates, uh, it happens sometimes it may be, let's say, 10. It's non what we call non prepacked food. Um, to be given to food donation to a charity, it happens. We have a lot of examples, but it's not so straightforward uh, because it has to be given very quickly. Uh, there is no expiring date. There is no packaging. We have to provide the packaging. So the food donation, again, we have agreement locally and at national level in our membership too. And we are working towards uh, streamlining it, finding ways to reduce the obstacles to that. But um, but it's it's not that easy, uh, even though that's something we want to improve, let's say. And that was not a, a, a reply to your question. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Vincenzo, you want to you want to say one very yeah. last quick word? Yeah, but just what's just what's to add, saying? as I've said that we recover mostly from the from the production companies, but one of the stakeholders we are investing more into are the large scale retail so supermarkets in the last couple of years, also because them from marketing reasons or whatever um, produce a, a lot of waste or maybe surpluses that then we can recover also because you know there is a, a difference between an expiration date and the best before so uh, supermarkets are not selling more in Italy you can uh, sell uh, products that are past uh, the, the best before but of course they are not doing it for a marketing reason so it is a, a a chance for us to recover more food. So I, I would don't I would just to, to to add this to my previous comment. I, I'm sorry we didn't answer the question correctly. Well, it's a tricky question, but I guess that in a way you are answering that longer supply chains in principle probably generate more because if you find a lot in retail, I would imagine there's probably a link there. Um, great. Thank you so much uh, for all this exchange, all the information you've shared. Uh, thank you also to everyone in the audience that's been really active in the chat. Uh, I tried to bring in as much as I could into the conversation, but I see that people are also uh, chatting very, very, uh, very much in the in the conversation. So thank you so much for that. And I would like to now bring in uh, Pamela Pokorni. She is a program manager for education at EIT Food. She's the one behind all the different online courses that you might be taking. Uh, so. I'd like to give Pamela a final word. Over to you. Hi, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and we appreciate you supporting uh, EIT Food as we work toward our mission for a net zero food system. And if you haven't taken our course on uh, food waste, it is available on Future Learn and edX until the end of the year. And um, thank you so much, Sean Paul, and all of our speakers and our course learners. We really appreciate you coming and having this interactive session with us. Thank you.